Welcome to this second video. Today we are going to continue our study of topological spaces and more concretely we are going to continue looking at this idea that topological spaces may have holes that we want to detect. We already pointed out that depending on the type of the hole one may want to use different tools to detect it. Our current goal is to focus on holes that can be detected using loops or paths. It is advisable to begin by studying particularly simple examples. So what we will do is work this out in detail for the real line and for the circle. In order to simplify the exposition, it's probably best if we actually define some things properly before we start. Imagine we have a topological space A, and there we fix two points, P and Q. We may focus our attention on paths that begin at P and finish at Q. If two paths can be deformed into one another, we want to regard them as being the same. Therefore, the object we are interested in are the equivalence classes of paths with fixed endpoints up to homotopies that preserve those endpoints. We will denote the set of all those equivalence classes as pi1 of A, P, Q. There is a particular case that is of interest, which is when P and Q are the same point. That is, our paths must begin and finish at the same place, in this case P. Then we are studying loops, and then we write pi1 of A, P for this object. This is called the fundamental group associated to A and P, and we will see later in the further videos and lectures that this is in fact a group, as the name suggests, but for now we will just focus on its structure as a set. Today we're going to prove three statements. The first one says that in the real line, there's a single equivalence class of paths with given endpoints. This corresponds to the idea that the real line has no holes that could be possibly detected using loops. In fact, a more general statement is true, which is the following. Euclidean space has no holes at all. The way to see this is to prove that Rn is homotopy equivalent to a point. As we shall see, these two propositions are actually quite easy to prove. Then we will focus our efforts on the circle, and we will prove that given any point P in the circle, there are Z possible homotopy classes for loops that are based at P. This integer classifying loops up to homotopy is precisely the number of times the loop turns around the hole. We won't be able to provide a completely detailed proof in this video, but at least we will explain what the main steps of the proof are. Alright, let's focus now on the real line. We fix two points P and Q in R, and even though we are drawing them as distinct points, we don't need to do this, you may as well make the same reasoning with P being equal to Q. Our goal is proving proposition A, that studies paths that begin at P and finish at Q. Since our paths are maps parametrized by the unit interval, it is probably best if we draw the unit interval as well. Recall that each path should take 0 to P and 1 to Q. Let's gain some intuition by looking at a few examples. The first path we consider is the linear motion that starts at P and finishes at Q. We call it gamma 1. For comparison's sake, let us draw some other example gamma 0 as well. The point of this animation is showing you that gamma 0 could be extremely complicated as a function from the interval into R. In order to compare gamma 0 with gamma 1, it's actually best to look at their graphs. Now we see r vertically and the unit interval horizontally. We will show first the graph of gamma 1 and then the graph of gamma 0. We see that the graph of gamma 1 is a straight segment, because gamma 1 was linear, whereas the graph of gamma 0 oscillates back and forth until reaching q. Nonetheless, there's a deformation, a homotopy that takes one to the other, and in fact, we can write it explicitly. This formula exploits the fact that R is a vector space. Namely, given some t in the interval, we can interpolate between gamma 0 of t and gamma 1 of t. And this will happen in a way that is continuous in both t and s. All that we used is that any two points in R can be connected by the straight segment. Therefore, this argument applies as well to prove that the pi1 of Rn is also trivial, or to prove that the pi1 of any convex subset of Rn is trivial. In particular, you may remember that we already proved this for the open disk in the previous video. 
All these facts follow from proposition B, which says that Rn, or any convex subset of Rn, deformation retracts to a point. In the case of Rn, this basically works by taking each point and pushing it towards the origin along the straight line that connects them. This concludes our discussion about the real line and about Euclidean space in general. Let us focus now on the circle, which we regard as a subset of the complex plane. This is convenient in order to write some of the formulas that will appear later on, but sometimes we also think of S1 as the one-point compactification of R, or as an interval whose endpoints are identified. We will be studying loops that for convenience we base at the point 1, but we could do this for any other P in S1, and our goal is proving theorem C that says that there's Z many homotopy classes of loops in S1 based at 1. All of our loops will be parametrized by the interval 0, 1, so we draw it as well. We will show next three examples of loops, and as they appear, you should try to figure out how much they turn around the whole of S1. The first one we know already, it is the loop that turns once counterclockwise at constant speed. We call it gamma 1. Here's another example that we denote by beta, and if you look closely, you will see that it also makes one counterclockwise turn. In particular, theorem C tells us that these two loops must be homotopic to one another. But how do we go about proving this? As in the case of the real line, it is much easier to look at graphs and not at movies in which a point is moving around. Therefore, what we are going to do next is out of each loop in S1, we will produce a path in R that contains all the information about the loop. This has two advantages. First of all, the graph of the path will be really easy to draw. And additionally, proposition A already tells us that the classification of paths in R up to homotopy is trivial. Let's look at the animation. On the left, we see the real line appearing vertically in red. On the right, we see the real line again, but displayed as a spiral on top of S1. On both sides, you see that we've marked out the integers. You should think of this picture as follows. S1 is a quotient of R. As we said in the beginning, S1 may be thought as being the unit interval with its endpoints identified, or equivalently as R quotiented by the action of Z by translations. The quotient map is then the exponential, and you can regard the spiral precisely as its graph. This means that if we take a point in S1, let's say the point 1, then its preimages, which are all the integers, will appear vertically above and below 1 in the spiral. The point is that we can use this quotient map to study loops in S1. How do we do it? Well, the idea is that a loop is simply a map from the interval into S1. As such, it can be written as e to the power of 2 pi some other function. This other function is then a function that goes from the interval into R, and we call this the lift. Lifting is a good name for this because what we are doing is taking a map into S1 and lifting it to the spiral that is on top. Alright, let's look at that one example again. If you look at S1, you'll see that we are simply describing one loop. So this is again gamma 1. If you look at the spiral, you will see that the lifting process has produced a path that goes up one level as it goes around. Additionally, since we are going at constant speed around the circle, we are also going at constant speed in the spiral. This means that the lifted map to R is simply the map that takes T to T. A key observation is that gamma 1 tilde, the lift that we've chosen, is not the unique lift of gamma 1. What you should note is that the point 1 in the circle has z many preimages, which are precisely the integers, as we said. This means that when we lift the first point of gamma 1, all the integers are a good choice for the first point of gamma 1 tilde. However, once we've lifted this first point, gamma 1 tilde is completely determined, and it will be simply a straight segment of slope 1. This applies to any loop gamma. All of its lifts will differ from one another by some shift by an integer. And let us emphasize again, this corresponds to the idea that every point in the circle has z many preimages in the real line. In fact, we can reason as follows. Given any loop in S1 starting and finishing at the point 1, once we lift it to a curve gamma tilde, 
we'll have that gamma tilde must finish and end at some integer. This means that the difference between gamma tilde of 1 and gamma tilde of 0 is an integer as well. And in fact, it will be the number that measures how much gamma is turning around this one. For this reason, we call this difference the turning number. Our previous reasoning shows that this difference does not depend on the lift. In the concrete case of gamma 1 that turns clockwise once, we see precisely that the turning number is 1. The next easiest example is gamma 2, the loop that turns twice clockwise around this one. As we see here, the lifts of gamma 2 send t to 2t plus some integer. In particular, we see that the turning number is 2, as we expected. In general, gamma k, the loop that turns k times counterclockwise around this one, will be lifted to the map that sends t to kt plus n, where n is some integer. Let us look then at a more interesting example. Here we have a loop nu that turns once clockwise, then four times counterclockwise, and then finishes turning clockwise once more. This means that nu has turned twice counterclockwise in total, and we see this on the left. We have a lift nu tilde that starts at zero and it finishes at two. This means that the turning number was two. This means that we have two curves, nu and gamma two, both of which turn twice. As such, theorem C is telling us that these two curves must be homotopic to one another. And how do we prove this? Well, we invoke proposition A. Proposition A told us that two paths in R with the same endpoints are homotopic to one another. And this is exactly the situation for nu tilde and gamma 2 tilde. As we saw earlier and as shown in the animation, explicit homotopy is given by linear interpolation. What we can do then is take the homotopy between nu tilde and gamma 2 tilde and use its projection as the homotopy between nu and gamma 2. What this argument shows is that if two loops have the same turning number, that is, they turn the same amount around this one, then they are homotopic to one another. Lemma 3 states that the converse is also true. If two loops are homotopic, then they must have the same turning number. This claim is actually very similar to Lemma 1. While Lemma 1 was telling us that the loop into S1 can always be lifted to a path into R, Lemma 3 is saying that a homotopy of loops into S1 can be lifted to a homotopy of paths into R. And now we are done. Up to filling in the details of Lemma 1 and Lemma 3, this completes the proof of Theorem C. This brings us to the end of this video, so let us summarize what we've seen. First, we proved that there are no interesting loops or paths in the real line. The way in which we did this was exploiting the vector spaces structure in R. Exactly the same reasoning allowed us in general to contract Euclidean space to its origin, showing that it has no holes because it's homotopy equivalent to a point. Then we moved on to theorem C, which is one of the first big results in this course. It says that there's Z homotopy classes in pi 1 of S1, and each homotopy class corresponds to the amount the loops are turning around the hole. We broke down its proof into four key statements. The first one says that any loop in S1 can be lifted to a path into the real numbers. Even though this statement is very intuitive, we will have to provide a rigorous proof for it later on. Using lemma 1 and the notion of lift, we then define the notion of turning number of a loop, which is basically a rigorous version of the notion of how much a loop is turning around the hole. We saw that the turning number is well defined because all lifts differ from one another by an integer. That brought us then to lemma 3, which is basically a restatement of theorem C. One half of the lemma we could just prove by picture. Namely, if we have two loops and they have the same turning number, then they must be homotopic. This followed from the fact that we could construct an explicit homotopy between their lifts. Both lemma 1 and the hard part of lemma 3 are consequences of a more general statement called the homotopy lifting property. We will be looking at this very soon. This concludes the sketch of proof of theorem C and also the video. So thanks a lot for watching, take care and all the best.